Hello everybody and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. This is the movie guy who tries to draw, James Cork, and with me I have podcasting machine and planes walker extraordinaire, Norman Sanso. I have a cigar. No, I got... Okay, fine. We're gonna find you a confession. Stand, don't worry. It's gonna be okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. And also the man, the myth, the hippogriff, awesome brony reviewer, Silver Quill. Meh. And review's over. That's all for today. So this been, this has been, no. No, we're not, we're not doing that. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I think we could end right there. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the one where Pinkie Pie knows. That's episode 19 of season 5, overall episodes number 110. Written by newcomer to the show, but better than on the books, GM Barrow. And like before, I'm going to read you the blurb directly from the wiki because I'm not very good with words. In this episode, Pinkie Pie finds out Princess Cadence and Shane in Armor are going to have a baby, but she finds it difficult to keep the secret away from her friends. So, okay, uh, let's, let's give our first impressions on this one because apparently we're gonna have quite a lot of different points of view despite having, uh, having just three people in here. Uh, so, guys, what do you make of this episode? What, what are your thoughts on it? And, once again, I am on the command chair, so that means that you, Silver, go first. Meh. <laughs> no, <laughs> really? Dude, come on. See, oh, well, I'm, to... I'm sorry, but we're talking about Keats' shining armor here. And I don't want to be meh, but I'm meh. And I will be meh next season. Because <laughs> I've lost these two. They Or they have lost me. Somewhere along the lines, I just gave up. On them as characters. Was it because of that one time they kicked you out of bed? Well, that was just a, that was a private moment, and a, and as we know, that was me predicting the future. I was fully aware that they were going to unveil that, and it wasn't a voyeuristic fantasy on my part. No, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Either that, or you took part in the <laughs> in this conception. <clears throat> okay, if the child comes out with a beak, I'm calling myself Grand Duke of the Crystal Empire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but Shane okay. is going to kill you. <laughs> now, now that I've lost all the parents and young children in the audience, so sorry, y'all. All right. Be, be semi-serious here now. One, for this episode, I enjoyed Pinkie Pie. I enjoyed her antics, her physicality, uh, her tension. I enjoyed the fact that she was finally getting her comeuppance for Green Isn't Your Color, Miss Forever. Here's my thing. In green isn't your color. I thought Pinky was wrong. That she was silencing Twilight when Twilight, as a friend, sometimes you have to break a promise for the good of your friend. And I think that was the case. But then that would have ended the episode quickly. So here's Pinky physically threatening Twilight. You ever notice that? That when she's eating that apple, she can yeah. be all cutesy about it, but she was threatening to hurt her. C- cutesy. That's the least cutesy apple eating scene I have seen in Did my life. Did you see that one PMV that somebody made? Uh, instead of apple, it was a bird. Oh God, that's a classic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, but here's the thing: ninety percent of this episode is just Pinky trying to contain her herself, and they they announce in the opening sequence that Kansas and Shining are having a baby. So that uh, people have debated was that good, a good idea? More on that later. <laughs> but the thing that kills it for me is that this whole thing is based around Cadence and Shiny. And they are my least favorite characters in the show, not because they have done anything inherently wrong or that I think that their characters are inherently flawed. It's that all this stuff happens and it never affects them. They are always the perfect fairy tale couple. And after a while, I just realized my whenever they're involved in an episode, my energy level decreases, and I and I generate a general sense of meh, and I don't want that. But here we are. You basically want to care about these two characters when, in fact, you are dealing with a, a ponified version of the prince and the princess from uh, Sleeping Beauty, Disney's Sleeping Beauty. Oh, even worse than that, Gainsay never fought a giant dragon. Well, shiny uh, armor yeah. ain't never saved a princess. He's the one who, in in true. Uh, progressive fashion. Now it's the knight in distress. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that's how useful he is. Now the funny yeah. thing is, this episode actually raised my opinion of Shining Armor a little. 
because we got to see him being a kid at heart. Finally, some characterization of, of this character after three seasons. But even then, Cadence remains the perfect princess. And I could go do a whole video on why, why I think that's unhealthy and probably the worst possible use of her character right now. I'll harp on this later, I promise you. Well, uh, let's hope that they, they, they do something with her, or if like, they, they know what to do with her. I always saw, oh, wait a minute, I'm jumping off, uh, I'm jumping at, uh, out, out of place. It's not my turn to talk about first impressions. Uh, unless you are not done with your first impressions, of course. Meh. <laughs> Meh. Okay, fine, good. <laughs> it's going to be a meh fest today. <laughs> what about you, Norman? What do you think of this one? Hmm, I remember when I first watched this, it was pretty interesting because we get to see, well, like Silver said, Pinky getting her comeuppance. Like, revenge for that episode. Good on you. <laughs> uh, but honestly speaking, this this episode was pretty okay in my books. It was, mm, I won't say meh, I, I enjoyed this one. It got me in stitches at a few parts, but the whole thing, the whole conflict was a bit lost on me because it would be better if we didn't know what Pinky knows so we would be on the main six side to know what they know so we would be like looking at Pinky like oh what does she know, what can she tell ah! but since we're on her side we're at another point of view where oh god why are the main six torturing her? Why are suddenly babies all over the place? Oh my god! But overall, this this episode is just full of hijinks. It's just fun to look at how Pinky handles certain scenarios. And I do love this one scene where she's practically predicting what Twilight's going to say. And Twilight just say, how do you know all this? And just Pinky says, Pinky senses? <laughs> that Oh uh, yeah, that's awesome. That's just awesome. And overall, like the whole episode here, I just like it. Like I, I just enjoy the scenes. Like I just like it. That's all I can say. To me, I think this is another episode of this season where Pinkie Pie is the one that makes the episode, the one that saves it. Uh, she did that in the Lost Treasure of Griffinstone. She did that in Party Pooped. And she's doing it in this one. If it wasn't for her hijinks, her sense of humor, her the the her cartooniness, and just general likable personality, and that <laughs> the ending shot is one of the funniest fourth wall breaking jokes I have ever seen in my life. If it wasn't for all that, this I I I'd be in the same boat as a Silver Quill is like a meh, meh, because yeah, when you think about it. Unless they are allowed to do something with Cadence, perhaps giving her a baby, she will end up being the bestest mother in the world. The way, she, the, the same way she is the bestest princess and the the bestest at at ruling and everything. It's like, yeah, I'm sorry, but I I I'm not all that thrilled about them having a baby. In fact, I'm more thrilled about Twilight being an aunt and than than anything else. That that will be fun if they ever do something with that. But yeah, no, I like this episode. I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty, pretty alright. Uh, I'll watch it any, any time. And to be honest, when you have a newcomer on the show making a debut, this is definitely no mysterious murder well. Mm -hmm. There is worst, there is worst debut episodes out there, uh, than, than this one. I think GM Barrow did a very good job for her first outing on Pony. And I, and I hope we see more of her. Like this is the only episode she wrote for this season. I'm like, come on, GM Barrow, do, do, write more episodes. I, I'm looking forward to another one. So, okay, uh, we did agree that we were going to talk about themes on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which theme should we tackle first? Should we go with uh, with the, the protagonist of the episode, talk about Pinkie Pie, or leave her for last? I, I think we should talk about the fact that they spoiled the secret in the first act. Yeah, that that was just oh wow. Like I mentioned <laughs> before, it would be fun to be along the main six and just be wondering what what secret does Pinky have? But I think that's a totally different scenario when you look at it because if you look at 
the episode that we got. It's basically one of those episodes where you remember Liar Liar, the Jim Carrey movie. Oh gosh, that one. I remember him beating himself up a lot in that. <laughs> the way that movie was done was him trying to keep a secret and or not talk or tell the truth because um his son gave him well his son made a wish saying that he has to tell the truth so it was pretty interesting concept there but in this episode pinky has to keep a secret from the main six because well it's all about a secret and she's just too happy and hype because her best friend's going to be an aunt yay but we already knew so the suspense is not there anymore so our point of view is skewered towards Pinky's, Pinky's view of how to keep a secret. And at the same time, uh, a few other people know, which is the mayor, the cakes, and I think the guy who works at the uh, furniture shop knows too. Which Actually, is it, would have been, it would have been funny if half the town knew and no, everyone was trying to keep the secret. Uh, yeah. But it's, it, it's kind of like that in one point of the episode. We'll talk about it when we reach uh, the part with Mayor Mayor. But yeah, I think they, they, what they were trying to do, and to be honest, in my case, it, it actually succeeds. They are putting you in the same position as Pinkie Pie. So because you know, along with Pinkie Pie, you're kind of like, a, you're a, kind of like an accomplice with her because you know the secret. Now you're in on the secret. Nobody else knows. To me, that only makes me relate to Pinkie Pie even more. Well, the scenario there is if you can talk to the main six, that would work. That, that would put you in, like, that will make you like, oh no, I don't to keep the secret, but oh no. Well, this is different. This is not like, uh, this is not like keeping a secret for the sake of not hurting a friend, like in green is in your color. This is actually something up, which is quite a big deal. When somebody is going to tell you that your family is going to get bigger, you want it to be done the right way. So the pressure that is put on Pinkie Pie and the fact that she honors the, 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 the promise and doesn't spill the beans, even though it ends up Shattering her into pieces at the end of the episode in a rather hilarious flash, <laughs> flash animated way. Uh, it's, it, it does speak more about her character than anyone else. Like the amount of pressure that Shining and Cadence put on Pinky was kind of like unfathomable, but she managed to pull through. Actually, I gotta say, Cadence and Shining, not the best planners. You couldn't have gone with a different bakery than the one where you know one of Twilight's friends is working there. I think it's the only bakery in Ponyville, yeah, so there is that, no other also, choice. For they're the best bakers in Equestria. Go out of state for a rivalry, then. <laughs> uh, but still, but still. Uh, so yeah, that's that team. So what about the whole scenario here, like Pinky and the whole show in general? Like she's trying to keep a secret, and almost half of ta- almost half of the town knows it already. Well. Three, honestly, three ponies, but yeah. it, it would have More been like funny. Something like four or five, Who's right? The other two, because, okay, we got the mayor. Mayor, okay, you the have cakes. the mayor, mayor, the two cakes, Pinkie Pie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I will assume that, uh, the guy who is in charge of the, of the cradles, uh, mm-hmm. of the cradles is also in, uh, in on, in on the whole, uh, secret thing. And I think that, uh, Featherweight knows a little bit about it too. I would like a baby, even if it was a uh, uh, baby pony, please, <laughs> unless it's a royal pain. That's a very specific choice of words. <laughs> well, that, I think that was more Barrows having a little laugh at her own setup. I mean, yeah. here, here's the here's the funny thing. Uh, I've read two of Barrows' books, mm-hmm. Twilight Sp- three. I use, I've read one, two, three, no, four <laughs> books by Barrows. Wow. Uh, Twilight, this Crystal Heart Spell, Pinky and the Rocky Party Palooza, and Applejack, uh, and Apples, I forget the title. <laughs> uh, basically, Honest to bar- goodness, Shichiru. There you go. Very good. That's the one. Very good. Thank you. Her stories tend to be very simple in terms of events. There's one thing, and it's more just watching the pony kind of driven crazy because of it. Now, of them, I think the Twilight and the Crystal Heart spell was probably the weakest. I agree. But, well, that was her first book. It's always hard right out of the gate. Uh, so this is, this episode kind of mirrors that writing style. It's a very simple premise, 
And really 90% of it is watching Pinky struggle to keep the secret. And I, I agree with uh, James. Us knowing creates dramatic tension. We are in on the secret so we can just enjoy Pinky's shenanigans. Even though if for an older audience such as ourselves, we probably would be able to guess it within five seconds. And then the funny thing is it would probably be less enjoyable because we're like, just realize it, you idiots. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, they, they could have done either of those two, and the fact that they do it like this is more, more straightforward. It's like, there is no need to deceive the audience. They're going to figure it out immediately. Yeah, I, I'm guessing it's just certain scenarios. Like, personally for me, I would love not to know and be, like, in the suspense of the whole thing, but like Silver said, I would have figured it out pretty soon, unless I'm a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a dummy, Norman, come on. Yeah, but still, but still, um, it's one of those scenarios where it's gonna be interesting. So, yeah, um, Pinky here does pull off a lot of great shenanigans in here. Like, I would say that this episode is the shenanigan episode for Pinky because have we ever hijinks. got that? Yeah, hijinks too. But have we ever got that episode in past episodes or past seasons? This sort of hijinks, I. Don't I don't think we've had anything like that. Usually the main six sabotage themselves as they try to accomplish a goal. This is the opposite. This is Pinky trying to prevent her own sabotage. Do we get anything like that in the A Friendly Indeed episode? That one, Pinky was sabotaging herself and trying to be a good friend. Mm. Coming on too strong and really ruining Cranky's day. And still getting to be best friends with everybody by the end. Once you talk about it that way and me looking at it, yeah, I think this episode was pretty cool with how they approached it because if they would have gone for what I wanted, it would have not been good. Well, when we get to the scavenger hunt, I'll have different thoughts to share. Uh, what's stopping us? <laughs> well, there's not a whole lot, to be honest, because like I say, so much of this episode is just Pinky trying to keep a lid on. But let us not forget, Featherweight spoke. Oh yeah. yes, which is a first in no. the in, in the series. He did yes, it is. In previous episode. No, he didn't. Really? No, I think this he is did. the first time. This is the first time that Featherweight utters a word, and I am so glad that the voice matches the body perfectly. Like I couldn't imagine Featherweight sounding any differently. <laughs> I need to. You, would, you wouldn't want him with a deep baritone, baby. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello, He's ladies. The... My my <laughs> name is Featherweight, and I'm here to. <laughs> Lighten your mood, oh yeah, baby. Oh, I still, I still like that head cannon somebody has. That they say that featherweight is a spider pony oh, because he is the he was the photographer and worked on the on the uh, newspaper of the at the school. So he's like he's the Peter Parker of the ponies. Oh god, no, we don't need that. <laughs> oh, talking about Pinky shenanigans, like that oh. filing scene, that filing scene. Oh, that follows from the uh, theme that we had in Party Poop, where Pinky is super good at organizing. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty interesting. Yeah. They carried it over, which is, well, like I said, pretty interesting. They, 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 carried, uh, they carried it around without having to make a direct, oh, we're making reference to this episode, wink, wink, notch, notch to the audience. So you get continuity. Very mm -hmm. subtle continuity. That's good. Yeah. And continuity. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait. You need to pay 10 cents to Silver for that. Oh, damn it. <laughs> But, I'm taking your okay. thumb. Yeah. Fine. Ah, well, uh, no, I need those to draw. Don't do that. Well, but um, we get to see Mare, Mare in on it because, well, she had to put that tape on after yeah. Jack's uh, birth certificate. And, so, yeah. and, li and like every good mayor, like every good politician, she's escaping away from bureaucracy, <laughs> letting other people take care of it. <laughs> and she's even worse at keeping a secret than Pinky. I mean, she nearly <laughs> spills the whole thing until Pinky... Baby. I think actually does does uh, threaten her. Yeah, P Pink Pinky is like, uh -huh. and the mayor just shuts up. She's like, oh, okay. It's it's very good to see the inside of Town Hall, uh, uh, outside from the comics because watching that moment, I was like, oh, I'm reminded of the Friends Forever between Applejack and Mayor Mayor. That was good. But I need to ask you guys here, like, if you both know the same secret, would it be okay to talk about it? Well, one, if, if we didn't know the other guy knew, we, we'd have that double, double danger of spoiling it. Mm -hmm. But clearly in this scenario, Mayor, Mayor is talking like, 
she know what Pinky knows and like both of them are trying to talk about it and stuff because yeah Mayor emerges prancing in place in front of Town Hall that's oh, that adorable one. Know, and she goes out there and says no quit it <laughs> baby <laughs> But, uh, it, it, the thing is, at that moment, Pinky was with her friends. If she diverted away to talk about it with Mayor Mayor, that would just raise suspicion and, oh. and risk. I, so. I'm not talking about that scenario there to be exact. I'm talking about the one where she was fighting those files at Town Hall. And the mayor's asking, if you knew a secret and no pony else knew, would you tell? Mm. And Pinky's right to say no, because for all we know, Mayor Mayor has, uh, it has a different secret, like she just mortgaged Ponyville and it's gonna go to the Flim Flam Brothers, and it's all gonna be torn down, and that horrible future in Equestria is actually gonna be real. And I'm gonna know who the end times are here! Calm down, calm too down. soon, too soon. We don't talk about that yet. Not yet. We have like Energy. Six, Energy. six episodes before calm that. Calm down, down, calm down. Uh-huh. It ain't gonna happen yet. The timelines are falling, the dream is collapsing. Uh-huh. Oh, well, talking about collapsing, we get to see that Pinky is trying her best not to break down when she gets news that the royal family, um, Shining Armor and Cadence, are not coming today. They're coming back another day. Like, oh god. You can see her almost break down. Well, yeah, that's... <laughs> Actually, we're almost at the point where I can share my thoughts on Cadence and Shining Armor. Yes, yes. Yeah. Let's, talk, let's, let's talk about these two, but... Ah, oh, come on. Uh, really? Is that... <laughs> Meh. Okay, and that's it. Let's not talk about them anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, okay, no. Let, let's let's talk about them because for some for some reason the the showrunners decided to be bold and dare to give some sort of character to Shinin Armor. It's like, Evans. my God, well, they, oh, gasp, shock! They can do that. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, having them come to Ponyville instead of them, well, you know. Usually it's going to be, when we see Shining Armor and Cadence, it's going to be at the Crystal Empire. I'm glad that they decided to move them to Ponyville for vacation time and whatnot. Even though there's a lot of excuses given in between with their royal, whatever they need to do kind of job. But having them in Ponyville is pretty awesome. Smile and wave. (laughs) Wave, wave. And having um, Shining Armor talk to Pinky about, well, thanks for not blowing our cover, but can you please hold it for a few moments? we got stuff to do. And yeah, we, we get to see them, well, start something like the scavenger hunt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let, let's talk about Shining and Cadence first. Let's oh, talk okay. about these oh. two the, the, these two guys. What was there need to talk beyond well, the, the point? Okay, the fact that, the fact that uh, Twilight uh, decided to go out of her way and prepare a room uh, for uh, for her big brother with uh, paraphernalia and items from his childhood, like uh, his old toys, his comic books, posters to a, a fantastic reference to Doc Savage, by the way. I need to see that because this this show can pull off Doc Savage really well. <laughs> uh, an ant farm <laughs> that that was really cool. And then when Shining comes to the castle and. That <laughs> I love that during his reactions, it's all horse noises that you hear. It, having one of the most adorable moments in the in the in the series, where where Shining is so happy to see all of those things, it, reacting adorable. like a like a child at heart. True, but honestly speaking, right, like all those things, like those things are fine and dandy. But think about it: this is a room where Shining Armor and Cadence are going to spend the night together because they're a married couple and they can do that. They don't say that. Yeah, I know, but still, think about it. They don't really say that. They, they they set up the room and Twilight is like, they set up a room of the castle. She doesn't say, I set up the bedroom where they're going to sleep yeah, in the castle. But she set up a room of the castle for her brother. That's it. Yeah, take a look. See, it's, he's going to be spending the night with Cadence in there. Uh-huh, okay, okay. It's, it's... No, but what, they, what, what do you have to say about this, uh, Silver? Well, I, I'm with James. That That may be a room just for nostalgia. Uh, Shining might prefer to just spend one night remembering that childhood. Uh, but remember, we've got about a couple bajillion other unused rooms in this castle. Uh, yeah, it's not hard for them to cross the hall and sleep in a larger bed. I still haven't gotten used to that castle. Mm-hmm. But there are some landmark things about this. First off, this is the first and only time Shining Armor has come to Ponyville, which is weird. Twilight's sister-in-law has visited her more often than her brother now. True. I think this is the second time she did. Yep. 
but the, here's the first weird thing. Cadence and Shining, this is a big moment in their lives. They are here for less than one third the episode. <clears throat> Or at least on screen. They show up and say, hey, we're here, but we're going to send you guys on a quest that will keep you away from us. Okay, to set up the party, understandable. But this is the thing that drives me nuts about Kane's and Shining Armor. We're supposed to think they are the greatest couple, the greatest ponies, the best big brother, the, the sister-in-law you could always wish for. And they never are there. We're asking them to be to view them as awesome by third parties. Case in point. Cadence and Shining show up unexpectedly because uh, some sort of conference in Manhattan or somewhere uh, got delayed itself. The world uh, rearranged itself to, for their convenience, which happens a lot. In G.M. Barrow's book, Twilight and the Crystal Heart Spell, they talk about Cadence's origin and how when facing an evil enchantress, yes, they use that term, the evil enchantress's own power source suddenly worked against her in favor of Cadence. Cadence had no knowledge of this. She was showing courage and going to face her, but not a lot of smarts. And yet the world reoriented to not only win the battle, but make her an alicorn by accident. Then... I don't remember that part. Oh my god, that's so contrived. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. And then when, when Chrysalis had won, when she bested everyone... She suddenly stops paying attention and underestimates them, so Twilight can tell Cadence, go over to my brother and press X to win. <laughs> <laughs> and press X to show love. And it does. And then, Crystal Empire. Cadence is enfeebled. Shiny said, oh, she's doing such great things for the Crystal Ponies. Apparently the Crystal Ponies didn't even know where they were there. Mm -hmm. That's weird. And so Spike brings the Crystal Heart to Cadence. She swoops in with it and everyone's like, oh, you're our princess. You're our savior. And they're like, what? A, a, a tart sweeping in with crystal bubbles doesn't, doesn't, is a legitimate form of government. <laughs> I'm being oppressed by the system. Oh, wow. So th this is what I mean why Cadence is, Cadence is my least favorite character. Shining earned a few points with this episode because we got to see him young at heart. It's fun that it's following the comic line of making him a geek in the past. Mm -hmm. And that I kind of under that is uh, that is like a cross reference between media, like mm -hmm. from the comic a, to the TV show. Very possible. That's becoming a little bit more of a thing in the latter half half of season five. But is shining at the very least is a kid at heart, kind of undermining that whole macho alpha male shining armor concept. But cadence, the world always reorients to suit her. She has never lacked for a challenge, but that challenge often solves itself for her. So she really puts forth the least amount of effort. And that is why when it's announced right away that she's going to be giving birth to a child, I, I question one, will we even see her pregnant? Because that would mean, oh my gosh, this beautiful, uh, princess who has like this pony version of a beautiful body would have to be shown as with baby weight. Morning and sickness. Morning sickness, labor <laughs> pains. I'm not expecting any of that for Cadence. Skate, Odds are... Skate marks, yeah. If anything, I'm expecting that uh, Twilight will get to the Crystal Empire just as the baby's been born. <laughs> born off screen. They, they usually gloss over that. Um, because they then they're going to have to have the, the parents giving to the, the kids that talk about the bees and the flowers and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah they, they do that for, they do that for convenience sake. I know that, but that's kind of like, mm, you, you could like give the parents a hand and like, okay, we're going to tell you how to teach your kids how to talk about this. I, I find that unlikely. It'd be nice, but it, I, you know, I am being unfair because I'm scripting how this is going to go when it has any, when odds are the writing staff itself is just uh, starting to hit, put pen to paper. But uh, the other thing is, Keynes has had all these incredible things happen to her. She became a princess. She found her a place in Canterlot. But within a day, kind of like Twilight, she had to pick up stakes, move to a whole new home, and accept the responsibility of ruling an empire. She's newly married. She near uh, the siege of the Crystal Empire. You see her facing some challenges there. And now she's about to enter motherhood. None of these 
events have ever seemed to leave an impact. She's never been challenged to grow because she was perfect before the, she even entered the show. There well, is no interest in a character who is not growing. I think we can say that the cadence of the comics is more interesting than the cadence in the TV show, but that's I, maybe actually, because I, the... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but based just on Nay anything, we haven't finished the Siege of the Crystal Empire yet, yeah. but based on Nay anything... I haven't anything, even started it. <laughs> cadence was pretty boring in that as well. It was Shining Armor carried Nay anything as he became the geek. I, I like the characterization of Cadence in Nay everything because she was very... uh. You know, the pretty girl that everybody is crazy for in high school, that doesn't usually, that doesn't usually follow that trope of she's in love with the geek. She's usually the one that is in love with whoever they present. Because that, that character usually doesn't have a choice. Well, technically in anything, Cadence was, well, honestly speaking, was a prank. She didn't do much. She did show interest in shiny. But that's about it. Like she was crazy for him. Yeah, she, I mean, was, she was crazy. Cra- for him. She was crazy for him, but we didn't get to see that much at all because she's always been portrayed to be oh she's supposed to be in love with the jock, but in reality she has a thing for shiny. And when she babysits Twilight, we get, we get to see that she is crazy for shining armor. So we get to see that she and Twilight interacting, carrying out their master plans, but. In the end, it was more of Shining Armor who's doing a lot of things to put the gears in motion. Because if you think about it, if Shining Armor didn't do anything, the comic's not going to proceed that much because one party's not putting in effort and the other one is just being a plank. But you, you keep saying blank. You keep saying that she doesn't have any personality. Oh, she does. I don't. I, I don't. I don't agree. The thing with uh, the way that it works in in that kind of story, the girl that everybody is going for in high school, in those kinds of stories, they have the same saying and personality as the damsel in distress in a classic uh, girl uh, girl trapped in a in a tower being guarded by a dragon. It's like it's first come first serve to the prize. To whoever the writer decides to, is, is, should be the winner. They basically have no saying. They are there to be swept off their feet by the next, uh, by, by, by the guy that we are rooting for. So, the, the fact that Cadence wants Shannon Arbor, that, only that, that is enough for me to say, at least he has a saying in the situation, but, the, it's, it is clear that the cadence in the, in the comics is not as, and in the cadence in the comics might not be as interesting as, uh, many people say, but she's more interesting than the one in the TV show. Oh, and it yeah. hurts me to say this because I like cadence. Uh, but I'm starting to consider, to, to think about my, my, my own, uh, uh, <laughs> my own opinion. <laughs> because it is true. We don't see her struggle with anything. We don't see her having any conflicts. And we don't see her having much, much, uh, uh, personality. Other than she's perfect. I, so she's going to have a baby and she's going to be the best mother ever in season six, right? Here's, here's no, the thing. I, I would say that Cadence as the character we see here is, well, quote unquote, perfect. Like, we don't see her struggle or face any struggles that much besides the one that we're meant to see. And in the new comic book arc, I'm seeing less of what... But don't spoil it. Uh, no, no, I haven't read any. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it. Like, you know ah. the rules. Uh, but her actions in that one are questionable at best and like, she's just there to be there. Like, what Silver said. Um, those door open for her automatically and stuff. Like, yeah. But what I want to see here is Cadence having a personality. Like, at least be interesting as Mrs. Cake. Even though we don't see much screen time of her, we do know that she has certain goals, aspirations, and problems that she needs to face, especially when it comes to orders. So yeah, we do feel for Mrs. Cake, but with Cadence here, we don't see that much trouble, or we don't see that much struggle with her personality. We do know that she gets bored sometimes, but... uh... Just to jump back in... uh. Having gone on this long-winded speech about Cadence's presentation show, I do agree with with James on on the fact that she undermined the the 
valley girl high school ditz trope. She was she did have the autonomy of uh individual choice. However, she was also instantly absolved of any uh conflict because one, even Celestia hated the jock. Mm-hmm. The whole school yeah. hated the jock. So it's kind of funny when she says, Oh, I'm gonna go with him to the prom and dump him on the dance floor. <laughs> it's like, dang Kate, you cold. <laughs> <laughs> but in some ways, even the comic points out that everything Shining Armor did was kind of a wasted effort because he was, he'd already won the girl before he even knew it. Yeah. But he's what made the comic interesting. Th- that's what I mentioned before, like in terms of characteristic, in terms of personality, if Shining Armor didn't pursue it, we won't have the comic. We won't have that couple um, getting together because if Cadence is interested, why didn't she just Go and talk, or like start up a conversation and stuff. We do oh, know that. Norman, you know how difficult it is for that to happen. Have you forgotten how? Sh- maybe, well, okay, maybe it was in your case, but in high school, boy, was I shy. I was a nerve wreck. I wouldn't have been able to go to a girl and say, "Hey, uh, you're like I have." Oh my God! No, ah! I'm, just, I'm not saying. Run away. I'm not saying on um, shining his part. I'm just saying that. Cadence is very confident. She can get any boy she wants if she pursues it. And with this, we get to see her trying to pursue it, but it's kind of a bit too late. Like, okay. Perhaps it's the fact that she's expected to go with the jog, so she has to follow that due to social rules. Maybe. Maybe. Probably that. But I think what works in the comic and what works for the power couple, for those two, are that... Shining Armor's courtship uh, wooed Caden's heart, so we get that um, effort that's from Shining. For sing- <laughs> that's what you get for singing Oingo Boingo yeah. in the middle of a, of a stadium yeah. with every pony cheering. Yeah, uh, but but we, okay, we're we're going on a long-winded discussion about uh, the the comic book versions of Shaden uh, and Ka- yeah Ka- Cadence and Shining Armor. But that's perhaps to prove that point is that the versions of these two characters in the comic book. Despite them still being bland, they are way more interesting than they are in the TV show. And I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to let the, the comics seep a little bit into the show itself. Kind of like the same way that we're seeing Shining being a massive dork. I, I think <laughs> the main problem here is that it's more on to Cadence than Shining. Because, okay, in the comic book, we get to talk more about her. Like, well, what, like what we're doing now. Because, think about it, we've been talking only about nay anything not no we're not even including the one the newest comic that involves her we're not doing that we're just oh, talking about yet. the nay anything so, yeah we're, but, we're talking about nay well, anything not the new comic yeah well he, here's the thing that's the only comic they've really starred in uh cadence hasn't even been in a friends forever yet oh, nor is yeah. shining armor mm. she's going to Wait, have no 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 yes yes he has this... Shining Armor was in the Friends Forever with Twilight Sparkle and cadence oh, is going yes, to have yes. one Friends Forever with Pinkie Pie wow she is <laughs> Really? Yes, Where? because yeah, they they are going to they are going through the whole. Uh, uh, they are actually Cadence is gonna have a friends forever with Pinky, and Spike is going to have a friends forever with Cadence because they are going through the whole. Uh, let's have one with each one of the princesses. Spike has had one with Luna and Celestia. Pinky has had one with Luna and Celestia, and respectively, they're going to have one with uh, with with Cadence. Was it announced somewhere? I, I don't remember. Yes, yes, it's on Equestria Daily. It's mm. it's there in Equestria Daily. Right. They they did oh. announce it. Okay. First I've heard of first I've heard of it, but I'm glad. Mm-hmm, uh, yeah. And I and I and I did space uh, Shining Armor's appearance in in with Twilight. But again, there that was a little bit more of a dynamic as they we saw him struggling with being a ruler, looking so bored mm. uh, and overwhelmed, and then them talking about you know their roles as siblings. That's characterization that's interacting with the world came to shining armor to borrow a very silly tone they're kind of divorced from the rest of the world <laughs> yeah. but but here's the thing that i wanted to mention before with cadence's problem in the show canon is that she's bored of taking care of the crystal empire that's why she went to visit twilight that one episode when discord appeared and she was having fun taking down the tassel worm Adrenaline junkie. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, though, little by little, you're getting, we're getting more character out of these, uh, characters. Like, what do we know about Shane Armor now? We know that he's a dork, he likes comic books and, uh, and toys, he has a fond memories of his childhood, and he cries at weddings. <laughs> he is the captain of the Royal Guard, married with Cadence, and he lives in the Crystal Empire, and he's gonna be a father. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, okay, fair enough. We know about him more than we know about other characters from, like, say, the Gears of War series, where we, uh, <laughs> they are one-dimensional as hell, but. Nah, yeah, you I know, get I, the comic canon to work with, but no. Nah. It, 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 it ain't fair, but yeah, no, the way that I see it is that at least we're getting more out of Shiny than we were getting in season two, for example. We were meant to believe that he's the best brother, best friend forever, and then it turns out to be he's just a jerk. Who doesn't believe well, his brother or his sister? Hmm? Well, I can kind of, I can't, I can't fault him for being mad at Twilight who botched things, but I'm glad you mentioned that because that's the other thing with these characters. There's no overcoming a bad first impression. The show tried very hard in song to say this guy's the best brother. And inwardly, as that song was playing, I remember thinking, well, wait a minute. Where was he when Nightmare Moon invaded <laughs> as captain of the Royal Guard? What about the two times Celestia has visited Ponyville? Couldn't he, you tag know, he's tag along to keep her safe and to see his little sister? Uh, where was he when she had to move? Where was he when she got turned to stone? He was in the drawing board for uh, on uh, Hasbro's executive brand saying, okay, we need a new toy. Um, Oh, people don't like the pink Celestias. We're going to have to do white Celestias. But, sir, we need to do pink pony princesses because people like that. Uh, we're going to have to create a new pink pony princess. Uh, and uh, uh, We're going to put it on, on sale. But how are we going to emotionally relate it to the characters in the show? Uh, she's going to marry one of the... Bro- Brothers of uh, the main six. But, back. but yeah, is yeah, is yeah, are we going to marry him with uh, to marry her with Big Mac? Uh, no, because Applejack. Everybody knows that she's a background pony. Nobody cares about Applejack. Uh, and Twilight Sparkle is the protagonist of the show. There you go. We're gonna give Twilight Sparkle a brother. Uh, there is no need to like uh, relate him with anything. No, 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 no. I make something up and have Dave Polsky write it. There you go. Pin out. So, well, well, okay, so, you joke. You joke. <laughs> You joke, it is a very good joke. But there's also great truth in that. I'm not by joking. Their, it is a truth. By, <laughs> well, by their very, well, okay, you're half joking. You're, you're, you're telling the truth in a funny voice, which is the greatest way to tell the truth ever. Uh, but yeah, his very existence draws attention to the falsehoods. The, a good story involves you. It makes you believe the lie. All fiction is in essence a lie. Yeah. Uh, but here, Cadence and Shiny, by their introduction, by the way they behave, by the almost shameless merchandising they, that they represent, they draw attention to the fact this show is a falsehood. And it takes you out of the story. It takes me out of the story anyway. And that's why I can never really get enthusiastic about them because I look at them and I say, these two were, were the first time I really felt this show really was just selling a toy. <laughs> It's blatant in the way that they did it because uh, the the show to me has done creative ways of promoting the toys. You, They have a train set they need to sell. How do they do it? It's the main way of transportation in Equestria. The big toy set in season one was Toilet Sparkle's Balloon. Mm-hmm. And there is enough jokes about that. Oh, hey, it's Toilet Sparkle's Balloon. But the balloon was there from the very beginning. It's still yeah. there in the intro sequence. Yeah, um, it's very iconic. But yeah, it's very iconic. It, it was... It was the absolute very first time that we were, uh, we had the, 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 the veil removed from our, from our eyes and we actually saw the toy ploy right there in full display. Buy our toys. Buy the, buy the, 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 the wedding set. And after that, every season finale was, has been pretty much like that. Twilight has wings now. Buy Princess Twilight toys. Uh, Twilight has a castle now. Buy Princess Twilight castle toys. Um, I'm trying to figure out what was the toy ploy for this season finale, though, because I don't think that they want to promote a time travel, um, time time machine that allows you to go into a uh, the alternate universe of the Man on High Castle. I so, got no idea oh, what the toy ploy for oh, this season, man. Oh please, please let it be the Sombra brainwashed army. <laughs> hey kids, but... do you want to use a Sombra's helmet? 
So, kids, you you want you want your little girls to enjoy something like GI Joe? Here's a pony war. Okay, guys. Okay, guys. Um, Reeling you back that. in. Reeling you back no, I, in. No, he's not. I would, we're, we're, no, Hasbro. We're Hasbro, toys. Hasbro, hear me now and understand me later. Make this war thing a, a merchandise that'll sell like hotcakes. <laughs> Alternate universe. I wa- if they are not going to do it in the TV show, I want to happen on the comics. Oh wow! I want it on the comics. <laughs> okay, reeling you guys back in. Reeling you guys back in. Um, this episode. <laughs> Okay, this, well, that's the thing. We'd rather talk about anything but this episode because Cadence and Shining cannot hold the focus. And it's, it is funny that in that cell, okay, the scavenger hunt that shows Shining Armor in Twilight's history, that's again a little characterization that shows how he was a good brother. That's wonderful. But again, I care more about that in regards to Twilight's history than anything of these two. When they say, oh, we're going to have a baby, and they're standing, and, you know, Shining Armor and Mr. Cake are exchanging fatherly high fives. <laughs> that uh, was a great moment. Th- that was a great moment, and I think, oh, that's the, the proud papas. There you go. The funny thing is I still romanticize the Cakes as a great couple. Oh, they are. They are. Be- because when they when they need a full sitter, they have to go all over town, ask each of the main five, and maybe a few other ponies if you wanted to flesh it out which they didn't. Cadence and Shining are just going to have to open their front door and ponies will have lined up. They have the resources of an empire behind them. This child will want for nothing. So the challenge, and because Cadence and Shining are perfect parents, I don't fear they're going to have to contend with the princess being spoiled. And let's be honest, it's going to be a princess. I don't know if it'll be an alicorn, but it will be a princess. Go Skyla! (laughs) Phew! Okay, I I like to believe that the the staff of this show has more creativity than recoloring Sweetie Bloom and giving her Luna's finery. Oh wow! Well. But you know what? <laughs> you know what? That's for when we face that problem there. But as for now, this episode is almost ending, and we get to see that very awesome no moment. Don't no. That it. was that was the the best moment of the entire episode. But then again, that's because this episode is made by Pinky. If it wasn't for Pinkie Pie mm-hmm. and her constant struggle to keep her mouth shut and not spilling the beans, this episode is going to be as engaging and interesting as it is. Oh, yeah, like, I-, I, watched, I watched this episode not for Shiny, not for Cadence. Hell, I, I don't even watch it for Twilight, even though she has perhaps one of the most touching moments where she's like, oh my god, I'm going to be an aunt. And I'm like, this is so cute. Twilight is like, ah, oh, this is awesome. It's like, that's cute. But no, Pinkie Pie is the one that holds the episode together, even though at the end she kind of falls apart. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that moment where she's saying no to the camera, to me that was like putting the cherry on top of a, on top of a fairly well-done cake. And like I said, for GM Barrow, her first episode... I think her writing works better this way. Um, like she's very good with with writing hijinks and uh, not not scruple humor. What is that? Oh, what do you call it? Um, the slapstick. Mm. She's very good at writing slapstick, unless the slapstick comes from uh, from the directors working on the show. But I think that this is a very good first episode. Mm. But talking about this kind of humor and whatnot, and, talk, and mainly talking about Pinkie Pie humor. Only a few writers have done Pinkie Pie well. And one of those writers that come into my mind is uh, Amy Keating Rogers. Like, she knows how to write Pinkie. And, well, since she's not here anymore, we got we need to find a new writer who works well. And I think GM Barrow here works perfectly fine in this kind of setting. But the problem with this kind of setting is it might get old pretty fast. Well, we'll have to wait and see. I mean... One episode, and it was a fun episode in its own ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mostly, like, I agree, just watching Pinky try to keep the secret. We'll see how it, how it fleshes out, because, like I guess they have read Jim Barrow's books, and they've gotten better with each iteration. They've gotten a little more active. And that's important, I think, that it shows she's finding her stride. So she'll find more of a stride in the show, I hope. Yeah, I hope so too, because if we're going to get more episodes with Pinkie Pie being slapsticky all the time, like I said, it's going to get old really fast. 
Yeah, but in this one it worked. It was it didn't, it didn't overstay her welcome. Any time that there was a slapstick, it was uh, compa- it was compartment- co- uh, compartmentalized. Like it was within the theme of each one of the uh, routes they were following. Yeah, but what I'm saying is like if we get to see more of this in the future, like more um, note by note scenes with this kind of humor in the near future, it's going to get old pretty fast. Like, I don't mind it at all, but if I'm going to get this kind of episode by GM Barrow, like, all the time, it's going to be old really fast. Like, it's going to be... Oh, don't worry. Look, Dave Polsky doesn't have two episodes that are the same. Same goes with Amy Keating Rogers. I don't think that GM Barrow is going to be the slapstick writer. Every writer, sooner or later, writes a slapstick episode. Yeah, so I, I do hope that we get more versatility by her. But hey, for the first time writing for the show... For debut, debut yeah, writing, yeah. Debut, debut writing, I, I find it entertaining. Like, I want to see more of her. Uh, I wanted to post a question to all of you guys, to, to both of you guys. And hell, the people in the comments as well. Um, When it comes to uh debut episodes, that is the first episode of a, of a writer, uh, where would you uh, rank this one? Like, where would you rank the, the debut of GM, Mer- GM Barrow? Like, would you say it's the best, is the worst, is middle of the road, is very good but not as good as, uh, what would you guys say? Oof, that's not fair. What do you mean well, that's I, not fair? I'm trying to count the number of debut episodes because we, we've had Mysterious Mary Well, Power Ponies, I think the Sleepless a, in Ponyville. Sleepless in Ponyville. Uh, mm-hmm. and this one? Castle. Castlemania as well was the first episode written by Josh Haber. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Well, then I can, I can give you my ranking right now. Oh, go for it, man. Uh, Flight to the Finish, no question. Top one. Top tier. Love it. Uh, Castlemania, fun, energetic power ponies. Uh, blatant toy merchandising before the toys were even hit the scene. But oh, yes. Still, but I still want kind, <laughs> kind of a fun, fun parody. Uh, then, uh, the one where Pinkie Pie knows. Pinky, this might also count as my final thought. Pinky carried this episode. She made it fun, energetic, and lively. Unfortunately, Cadence and Shining Armor can't breathe life into a story, it seems. And to be honest, this may be the episode that made me say, you know what? I'll make fun of these two because it's funny, but I, I just can't root for them anymore. And then Mysterious Mary Duel, which unfortunately was just probably one of the more awkward episodes of the show. Oh. Like, have that mentality. Back in 2011, we didn't know who this Mary Weather William was. And suddenly, <laughs> ah, the fun rage. <laughs> It was awkward not because of what that episode was doing, but because of what happened afterwards. <laughs> oh, no. Like, if we're talking about the mysterious Mary Duel as an episode, that episode was just full of contradiction and mean-spiritedness. It basically was against the, when, against the values of what this show is all about. You know, friendship, trust, honesty, loyalty, all of that. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind them doing that, but they're not doing it in a nice way or a proper way. Like, it... It took the character for who we know, but it kind of mm. twisted them and molded them into something that works for uh-huh. Meriwether okay. Williams' kind of writing style. We're so, not talking about that episode. What uh, else would you say, uh, uh, Silver? Like you said, those were your final thoughts. Uh, do you have yeah, anything? Oh, is that? Oh, will you? Oh, do you? Do I have anything more to add? Yes. Yes. Meh. Meh. <laughs> The, the running joke of this episode is very meh. <laughs> and wh- what about you, Norman? What ranting, ranting? What ranking would you have on the the debut episodes? Honestly, I don't remember everyone's writing. <laughs> like to me, um, Emmy Larson's first time writing is over over there too. Like everyone is there. Like like I I don't remember anyone's debut. Like if you want to talk about debut, Lauren Faust's debut <laughs> one and two that pulled me in. So yeah. But honestly speaking, if we're talking about this at itself compared to the Mysterious Mary Duel and whatnot, this is much better. I have no problems with this episode, and I feel like this episode is pretty awesome. I-, I do like it. When it comes to debut episodes, I think Cody Powell's work on Sleepless in Ponyville 
which was the very first episode that we had of what I like to call the Dream Trilogy, with uh, the, for whom the Sweet Evil toils and Bloom and Gloom. I think that that is the absolute best debut that anybody could have, because back then when we saw a new a new writer coming on the show, people got very worried very fast, and it, it, it was we were very fast at drawing conclusions. So it's like, ah, new writer, you're going to screw it up. It's like, no, no, she did a fantastic job. And to me, that is the, the best debut that they have uh, up until now. Power Ponies, I will say it's kind of a debut, even though only one of the writers working on the on that episode is working for the first time in the show. The other two, uh, the other two being veterans. I think this episode will rank below Power Ponies, but only because it's weighed down by uh, by Cadence and Shining. But not that much for me. I mean, I don't mind them. They don't ruin the episode for me by far. Not at all. But yeah, I would say that this is this is per- better perhaps than Castlemania, which is an episode all about uh, hijinks and fun. And let's spoof Scooby Doo, especially towards the end with a uh, villain shout out that is going to go absolutely nowhere. But that's fine. So I, ge- I guess this is, this is definitely one of the best debut episodes, at least for me. And I cannot wait to see more of GM Barrow's writing. I think she's a, she did a very good job. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm guessing that's final thought at the same time too, right? Yeah, for me, that's final thoughts. I'm very glad that I watched this episode. I'm very glad that GM Barrow is working for the show now. So I personally cannot wait to hear more about it and, and see more of her. All right, then. And I think that's about it. So, James, what's next week's episode going to be? Next week, well, because Christmas is coming, uh, everybody, we're in Christmas time. I think it's fair that we are going to be talking about Heartbreakers. That is episode 20 of season 5, overall episode 111, written by Nick Confalone. Uh, it's about the Apple family visiting the Pie family for Christmas. How is it going to turn out? Is it going to be National Lampoons, <laughs> the Apples and the Pies, or is it going to be Wars? Only time will tell. But that's another story for another time. Thank you guys so much for checking this episode out. Thank you so much for listening to us. If you want to le- to tell us what you think of it, just let us know on the comment section or send us an email at the uh, mbsshow at gmail.com. And as always, thank you so much for watching this show. We do this because of you, and if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to do it. This has been James Cork. Finally, I can talk about my secret. Ah. Meh. <laughs> the call of the wild silver quill. <laughs> it's like, I didn't Please get a new sound box with just you saying meh in different <laughs> in different accents and tones. It will be brilliant. Oh, I could actually I could do my best Dick Cheney impersonation. Meh, how dare you? Meh, you have no respect for meh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll, we'll see you all on the next MBS show reviews. Have a good one. See ya. Adios, meh. <laughs>